My name is Ian Bryson. I live in Connecticut, USA. In 2004, I met a Polish woman and we were engaged within two weeks. I married her, found out later that I married into a cult family and I ended up losing my daughter and going to prison. I had just received my master's degree and I was not sure what I was going to do next. A friend of mine called me up and told me that there were some Polish people living next to him that had come over on three-month visas and he said come over and check them out and I, I drove over and stepped out of my car and he was standing outside with three Polish people and when I saw um, my wife immediately I thought that she was the one after seeing her within an hour I invited all of them to move into my apartment building because it was it was owned by my dad and there was empty apartments they moved over shortly thereafter and she was living with her boyfriend and, and the other Polish girl and I let that go on for probably a couple days and then I just said come over and come over to my apartment and she she left that relationship without hesitation moved in with me and went across the street to call her mom and told, tell her that she had found her soulmate and so that boyfriend I, I felt bad I didn't really know how to handle the situation because it was there was no doubt that she was supposed to be my wife and I, I don't condone taking another man's woman but it was just because of who she was and what I felt I didn't care and so she moved in with me we lived together for a couple weeks and then I took her up to my aunt's lake house in upstate New York. She took a ring off of her finger and gave it to me and said, give it back to me and ask me to marry you. And I did. I was unwilling to consider anyone else's opinion. My family, especially my dad, tried to make me think twice about it. And friends were saying, what What are you doing? You know, how, how can you decide to be with her when you don't know her? And I, I hadn't met her family. I didn't know anything about her family except that she called called her mother frequently and I just kind of I blocked everyone else out and just sided with her 100%. I offered her ex-boyfriend a different apartment. I was trying to do the best I could uh, under the circumstances. He moved away to another place and then he came back because he wanted to get his things. I asked my then fiance not to allow him back but he came back and he came up the stairs yelling in Polish. He punched me in the face and I picked a knife off off the table and chased him down the stairs and he went down the stairs and called the police and told the police that I pulled the gun on him. So a SWAT team came to my house and they, they didn't find a gun because there was no gun. He was just trying to get me in trouble. Those charges were dropped. He was also sent out of the country for his part in it. So then um, my fiance's three month visa was running out. And so I decided to go to Poland with her in order to, to meet her family and to apply for a fiance visa. So after a couple of months of knowing her, she went over first to Poland and then I met her over there and I, I stayed in her parents' house with her uh, for the next few months as we waited for her fiance visa to be approved so we can return to the US and get married. I immediately noticed odd things about her family. Her mother appeared to me to be very miserable um, and just blank. I never could have a conversation with her, even even through a translator. Her father was an alcoholic. There was no talk about this. It was it was like a subject that was not allowed to be talked about. I considered it, chalked it up to be just something that happened in Poland. Her grandfather, one day when I went over his house, he asked me how my wife was in bed. And that was very strange to me. I looked at her and, you know, she, she didn't give me any, any information. So I just, again, I chalked it up to just weird cultural differences and, and never thought that there could be anything more than just a bad joke. When I was in Poland, that's when I noticed drastic mood changes and personality changes. And we would go from everything to being wonderful and perfect. And I thought it couldn't be any better that I, I had won the grand prize to her switching off and hating me, even while we were dating and engaged. And then I would plead with her, well, where did you go? What, what's going on? And I remembered the very good time. So all I wanted was that back. So it, it threw me in this spin where I was beginning to have panic attacks and and be uncertain of things but then like right right at those moments where I was at my worst then things would switch back to being good again I kept a journal at the time and in my journal I highly suspected that she had a history of trauma I didn't know what that could mean I was unaware of trauma that carried over into adult life I was unaware of continuing trauma I just discounted all of the bad things and sought more of the good things and then any any time I would leave the house she was she was worried about who I was going to be with. I asked her 
on multiple occasions about her relationship with her parents and about her childhood. I tried to talk to her about incest um, because the trauma responses that she was having appeared to me to be from a childhood trauma. I couldn't wrap my head around that she would bring me to her family, introduce me to them, and have me live with her father, go play basketball with her father, drink with her father, and she wouldn't tell me about it. So I just completely just wrote it off as this is this is a normal Polish family. We would visit Poland two to three times a year. She told me, when I'm in Poland, I'm not with you, I am my dad's. And I didn't do anything with that except go get a bottle of Jim Beam, basically, because it just, it flattened me and I, I couldn't go outside by myself because I didn't speak Polish and nobody there spoke English. I just lived in a constant state of panic. When she told me that, it didn't cross my mind that there could be ongoing abuse. I think I probably would have ended up leaving her if we hadn't had a daughter. Once we had a child, there was no chance that I thought I even could leave her. I, I believe that I had to work it out. So I pretty much submitted to whatever she was telling me was wrong about me and just said, okay, but can we also look at you? So I got her to admit that she had something going on. We both thought it looked like borderline personality disorder, but I, I got her into counseling and I emailed the psychologist and said, I, we both think it looks like borderline personality disorder, but please don't tell her. I just want to give you a heads up. And we continued going to counseling together and she was going to a separate counselor on her own. Once I saw more, more cycles, more trips to Poland and back, then it got to the point where I couldn't tell if the same person was returning to me. Everything about her would be completely different. And even an email that she had sent me the day before no longer pertained the day after. I found marks on her body and, and that's how I identified that this was actually the same person. It sounded crazy to me that I wasn't sure, but that's everything that she thought, everything that she was saying was the opposite. And so I legitimately could not tell if it was the same person. And then from there, I started researching on my own and it, it looked like she was possessed to me. I would have uncontrollable diarrhea. I, I would wake up in sweats and we would have to change the sheets. So my wife would just, if, whether it was diarrhea or sweat, she would just change the sheets and we wouldn't talk about it anymore. So eventually I, I, I pulled up a music video with, with like a, a devil figure in it. I called her into the room and I just said that this is, this is what I see when I look at you. Of course she looked normal physically but like the, the the feeling that I was getting and the, the fear that I had, that's what I thought I saw. I grew up as a Christian. I, I, I was a agnostic humanist at the time, the time this was happening. And once I saw just the, the spiritual whatever force in my home and, and trauma, trauma based force, I, I didn't know how to describe it. And so I, I, I tried to pray with her. Like, and, and that was the first time I had prayed in my adult life. I just prayed for her. And part of it was um, because I was trying to tell her what I saw. And part of it was because that, that just that's how afraid I was that I could actually just step out of my comfort zone and just like admit out loud to her that I am this, this afraid that I, I need God, whoever that is. My daughter was one when we moved to the Netherlands, and that's when we started having more contact with my wife's family in Poland. I didn't notice any signs of trauma in her until she was three. That's when she she began talking to me. That's when you know she she could express herself in a way that I understood. And I was a stay-at-home dad for a year, so I spent a lot of time with her. When I sent her to Poland, every time she came back, it was like the same degree of change as as my wife um, but it, this was a three-year-old child so she would come back with bruises and with fear about someone touching her pee pee and just screaming having panic attacks hyperventilating nightmares telling me there's a monster wetting her bed crying when she's trying to to go to the bathroom and also t talking about her her grandfather's private parts to, and just bringing them up out of the blue sometimes just with just me, sometimes with my wife there. And I would look at my wife and just try to figure out like under what circumstances would my father-in-law be naked with my daughter? But I was receiving no feedback from my wife. Those were huge red flags, but again, I thought my wife was on my side. And so I just thought I, I and I thought I had time. So I, I was making small changes. Like I, I decided that I would never 
send them to Poland alone. I decided that I, I had to watch this more closely. I was going to move my family back to the United States so that we were, we had support and I was in a place where I felt comfortable and I, I, I knew that I needed friends and family around me. So we had decided to move back to the United States. We applied for her visa and I went to the United States to look for work and a place for us to live. And I sent them back to Poland. And so for that three months, I communicated with my wife every day. And every day she said, I love you. You are my world. All I want is for us to be back together. The day that I walked back into my apartment in December, 2010, I went to give my wife a hug and a kiss. She said, Al, you're hurting me. I hate you. I've always hated you. I'm taking our daughter back to the cult. And that's the first time that I heard Colt in, in our whole relationship. It went from there, we were together in the same home for the next three weeks before the abduction. And she, she repeated multiple times that she was taking her daughter to the Colt. She said because of mind control that she had Stockholm syndrome. So ritual abuse is systematic, uh, intentional trauma, and it's, it's all kinds of trauma. Every kind of trauma they can use, whether it's physical abuse, sexual abuse, psychological abuse, spiritual abuse, and, it, and use it, it uses attachment of children because they they need they need their caregivers so it's it's generally the caregivers or someone the caregivers trust that is doing the abuse its intention is to control the child to to use the child for your own own ends i had seen this change in her before i'd never heard these these words before but i i told her this is the same thing what i thought we had healed is not healed we need to go get help and she, she just told me, it's not the same thing. I hate you, I've always hated you, and kept repeating cult to me over the next three weeks. I was in contact with her psychologist and, and our psychologist and telling them that she was threatening to take our daughter back to Poland, that she had our daughter's passport. I was afraid to leave the house because I thought that they might be gone when I got back, but I, I went to talk to the psychologist. He told me that she he was trying to contact her, that he was worried, but that it was illegal for her to leave with my daughter. I kept sending emails to these people telling them I'm terrified for the next three weeks, and I kept trying to convince my wife to go with me to get help. She refused. She just kept saying the same things. Two days after Christmas, in 2010, I spent all day outside playing in the snow with my daughter. Uh, my wife was in bed with a migraine and she told me that she wanted to, me to spend this time with my daughter and I told her that I wanted all three of us to spend the time together but then she she repeated again I want you to spend the time with your daughter so I I got up and made breakfast with my daughter we went out and played in the snow to several parks came back and had lunch and my wife was still in bed so we went back out and went to a farm the local farm uh, that we went to frequently we were gone most of the day until 4 or 5 p.m and on the way back my daughter was telling me she didn't want to go home she was telling me she didn't want to be with her mother that she didn't want to go back to poland and i told my daughter your mother loves you and she's she's probably making dinner for us and and we need to go back home it was kind of a long way back home and she kept telling me, I don't want to go home. I don't want to go home. And I kept reassuring her that her mother loves her and that everything was going to be good. And when we got home, my wife was waiting at the top of the stairs, dressed and ready to go. And that was the first time in three weeks that she had been dressed and ready to go. And she said, I want, I want to take her to the store to get art supplies. And I, I said, well, we can all go to the store in a little while, but I don't feel comfortable with you taking her to the store because you have her passport and you've been telling me that you're taking her to Poland. So she was upset. I took my daughter into the living room and turned on our favorite movie, made her tea and made us popcorn. We sat down on the couch and we're just trying to stay in our own world. And, and my wife was, was fuming and like kind of stomping around. She came and tried to convince me a couple more times that I needed to let her take our daughter to the store. And I said, you know, we can go to the store together in, in a little while. So then somebody else knocked on my door downstairs and he came up and distracted me and, and he was the father of one of my daughter's friends. So he came up and we started talking. We went into the kitchen to make coffee. And then he said, well, my daughter is at the library down the street. And why don't you, why don't you send your daughter to go, to go see her? And I, I just completely dropped my guard. After three weeks of knowing my wife had my child's passport and the threats she was making, I felt comfortable and I said, 
Yeah, of course you can go to the library and see your friend. So I was standing in the kitchen with this man and my wife followed my daughter into the kitchen. My daughter gave me a huge hug. It was so big that I felt like it was weird because you're just going to the library. I gave her a hug, told her that I loved her. She went down the stairs first. My wife looked at me and didn't say anything. She went down the stairs. That was the last time I saw my daughter. I continued talking to this other man for five or 10 minutes and then he said he had to go. Once he left, I called I called my best friend who lives in Mesa, Arizona, and I just said, I don't know what to do. It's happening again. My my wife's out of control. And as I'm as I'm telling him this, what my wife had been telling me for the previous three weeks just flooded back in and I realized they were gone. So I, I hung up with my friend and I splint I sprinted to the police department. And the police the police department was locked because of what time of day it was, which I wasn't happy about. So I pounded on the door. They came and I said, My my wife and daughter are going back to Poland and I, I know they're being abused in Poland and I need you to stop stop them from getting out of the country and they refused to take a police re police report they didn't believe me they handed me a list of family attorneys and told me that I needed to go home and, and deal with it on my own after the police department refused to help me I called back my friend I called my parents uh, and then I, I got in touch with a duty officer at the United States Embassy and the duty officer recommended to me that I, I not allow my daughter to get back into Poland because he said once they're in Poland, all bets are off. He said, you need to set up a meeting with your wife, re-abduct your daughter and get her to the embassy and then we will evaluate her. I printed out directions for the embassy and the consulate, uh, even though that, that felt extremely crazy to me and I had no idea how I would get my three-year-old daughter away from her mother and then to the embassy in broad daylight so then i just i continued contacting people because my wife was out of my house i was able to, to think more clearly I, I wasn't i wasn't having the uncontrollable diarrhea and sweats and things it, like that was gone so i i had i had peace in my home to some degree and I, and I just got into like processing what she had been telling me and you know as i realized what was happening what was happening which was very quickly i knew it wasn't good because i knew what she had told me i still didn't know exactly what it was right away but i knew i knew i needed to stop them from leaving the country so i just started sending out emails to everybody and demanding that they they help me that they take a look at this evaluate my daughter and pretty much nobody could wrap their heads around what I was saying or, or believe me. As that was happening, I became more frantic, more desperate. My parents initially were on my side telling me that, you know, they're very concerned. They want, they want to, they want to get it my daughter to to be evaluated and that continued for a few days until my my wife got in touch with my parents and then then i could see them not believing me anymore i continued trying to get help for the next four months and my parents went from supporting me to totally being against me to when i returned from the netherlands to connecticut my mom had me involuntarily committed to a psychiatric um, observation hospital and she tricked me into being committed to this and it was for a two week observation. I spent one night in the psychiatric observation unit and they were prepared to release me because once I talked to the psychiatrist, they didn't have anything to hold me. But then, then he came back an hour later and said, your mom and dad and your cousin called and so we're gonna hold you here for two weeks. So I stayed for two weeks, I was released with a a diagnosis of adjustment disorder. So I was released. I walked five miles to my mom's house and she gave me the keys to my car and $20 and told me I had to go elsewhere. And I just, every day I, I wrote emails. I reached out to people. I got in touch with a human trafficking organization that was willing to help. But because of the, the nature of international law, the only thing he was able to do was have the local police knock on my wife's door. And they asked her, if everything was all right and she said everything's fine here ian's the problem so there, there was nothing that could that could be done through the criminal justice system other than i i filed a hague parental abduction report with the u.s secretary of state and they told me that it could take two years to to get that to court and so my daughter was four at this point and I couldn't, I couldn't imagine waiting any longer than I had. The four months was already excruciating. And so within 
talking to the friends I was staying with and just, you know, meditating and praying every day. I, I just said, well, I'm her dad. I need people to listen to me and I don't see any other way except to put myself in the middle of it and make them listen to me. So I, I sold my car, bought a t ticket to Amsterdam and I, I drove to Poland through across Germany in one night and I didn't know what I was going to do. I, what I wanted to do was, was get my daughter, get her in the car and drive her to the embassy in Berlin, which was about an hour away from where they were in Poland. That was still the best advice I had received from the duty officer was to get my daughter and get her onto U.S. soil where they guaranteed me she'd be evaluated. You know, as I'm going into Poland, I'm realizing that that's, that's impossible basically because I have to get my daughter away from whatever adults taking care of her into a car and drive an hour to another country and I'm just thinking you know I'm gonna be a car chase or spike strips or helicopters or whatever it might be I didn't see that as a possibility and, and I still didn't know what I was gonna do part of me what part of me wanted to kill her perpetrator what I ended up doing was just kind of leaving it up to the last minute and just prepping myself to create a disturbance and just see what happened. And I, what I believed is that it didn't really matter what the details were. Uh, the situation was completely crazy to begin with, and it was gonna get crazier because I was now gonna create a, a big scene and I would start a new process. But what I believed is that no matter what I did, that there would be an investigation and that because of the investigation, they would have to do a child abuse investigation. And so I, I, was, I was confident that things were going to turn out the right way. I waited for my father-in-law to come out and I I crashed my car into a wall to block his exit back into his apartment building. I got out of the car and chased him down the street. He was he was completely surprised. You know, I just come from the United States. He dropped to the ground and and I I punched him a few times and it wasn't it wasn't out of anger. It wasn't um I wasn't I wasn't really trying to hurt him, but I didn't also didn't care that I was hurting him and you know there there was some you're hurting my daughter, so I'm kind of happy that this is the way that I've decided to get attention part of me. I wanted the attention because I believe that that was going to lead to the investigation and I was arrested and then I, I requested a new venue in court because my, my father-in-law is, uh, he works for the city and has a lot of friends. One, his best friend, uh, my wife's godfather, was a judge in the court I was being held, uh, tried in, but he said, no, um, you know, we're gonna send you to prison for pretrial for up to two years because we have you for assaulting your father-in-law and don't we don't care why you did it so i i ended up in a pre-trial prison in poland they put me in a cell with seven guys none of them spoke english and it was 23 hour a day lockdown i had no phone privileges i wrote to my parents and told them you know now now you can get me a lawyer and no response and i didn't see a lawyer for 11 months i have not gotten my daughter back i, I was released from polish prison in 2015 and uh, my dad came over to Poland because they weren't going to release me to myself. So he, he had to come over, then they let me go. And we immediately went to the city in Poland, uh, a, a slightly bigger city than where my daughter and first wife were, but to hire an attorney for family court to fight for custody and parental rights. So my dad took me to the attorney. We hired the first English speaking guy that we found. And he promised me that if we could prove that your wife is one percent to blame then then you're not going to lose your parental rights so we gave him money returned to the united states and then i proceeded to send him the documentation that i had of the fact that my my wife and i were seeing a psychologist together i tried to send him the email communication that i had between my wife and i i wanted him to revert back to ian's daughter should have never been taken from him but he he just he was unwilling to do that so what he wanted me to do was play the game in the Polish court and pretend like uh, I was okay with his family and that I just wanted to, to have visitation rights. And at, at that point, I just, I, I wasn't willing to play the game in that way. Uh, I realized that I had been had by the lawyer and if, if they were to give me visitation rights, I would have tried to abduct my daughter and get her to the to the US Embassy again. So I just, I switched gears and just decided I'm, I'm going to just, I'm gonna figure this out. I'm going to write my story. I'm going to, I'm gonna believe that uh, good does triumph over evil and try to figure out what that means. And I just, and I, I didn't come back and get a job. I came back and just researched and wrote and, and prayed and tried to figure out 
what was the right path for me to take every day, just thinking about my daughter and how to get her back. I still have not seen my daughter. No, I I, I Google her from time to time and I, I'm, I know what school she goes to. I know where my father-in-law works. I know that my first wife is remarried and has, has another child. So I've seen pictures of my daughter over the years, but my, my parental rights were terminated. So yeah, I, I have zero contact since I gave her the hug. I did see my first wife in court. I tried to question her because I knew that I could cross-examine her and put holes in her story. When I attempted to do that, she she either had or appeared to have a panic attack and went over to the window. And then from there, the judge banned me from questioning her and banned me from court from then on. Poland released me in 2015 and I returned to Connecticut to my to a farm my dad had. Even though he didn't believe me, didn't he didn't know what to believe. He just said, here's your room. He bought me, he bought me a car and um, just gave me the space to do what I needed to do. I had everything I needed to, to do the research I needed. I started writing and just started trying to get my, my mind back because I was, I was just blown away by this whole experience. I, j I decided that uh, basically that I was going to go all in on believing that God was the answer and, and that I was going to be a monk. And I was just praying and, and just believing that good does win over evil and that you know, I was just going to be a monk and, and never, never do anything else other than try to figure out what that was and, and try to align myself with good. And then right around the time where I was sure that was the way I was going to go, my current wife walked down the street and I followed her on my motorcycle and we, we spoke and then I didn't see her for a month and I didn't want to see her because I had already set my mind straight on what I was going to do and that I would, I would never leave my first wife, that I, I couldn't, I didn't want anything else other than her and then she came back to talk to me and I spoke to her and just laid out my story to her and I had my I had my wedding ring on from my first wife and she didn't care about any of that she, what she cared about was my story and what she could do about it and she, she was so moved that she just said what what do we need to do and and how can I help I kept my my wedding ring on for my first wife for for several months trying to push this new woman away and she she didn't care she immediately was all in and we started doing everything together she started helping me write my book and it's, it's just gone from there she moved in with me probably two weeks after me meeting me just as time went on I could see that she would she was the most honest person I had ever met totally unafraid of being vulnerable and open and just dedicating herself to to, to the cause of helping my first wife and my daughter and people like them and exposing this because she had, she had never heard about this either. And when I, when I showed her, she related to it because it's my, my daughter. I just think that that, that made it real for her and made her decide that, yeah, that, that's, that's what I think I need to do that, you know, and we were married in 2022. She edited my book and, and, you know, helped with writing and we just over the past couple years that's what we've been doing every day to try to make it as good as we can.